Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Know Your Data. I'm Kevin Hannigan, the Chief Learning Officer at Click, and as always, I'm joined by Alan Schwartz, a Pulitzer Prize nominated former New York Times reporter and member of the Data Literacy Project's advisory board. Now, we're into season two here on Know Your Data, where we unpack the numbers, charts, and terms we see in the media all the time. And today, there's no word more at the tip of everyone's tongue than this one, effective. With that, we'll have Alan get us started. Thanks, Kevin. You can't read the news today without seeing that word. Here are some of the headlines. COVID-19, Oxford University vaccine is highly effective. Vaccine in Russia joins the 95% effective club, and two companies say that their vaccines are 95% effective. What does that mean? Well, funny you should ask, because that's why we're here today, to talk about what effective means to the numbers in the numbers and what it means to you. And guess what? This might be a place, a weird place to start, but for now, effective is actually the wrong word. For now, all we know about vaccines is their efficacy, not effectiveness. There's a big difference. And that difference is that efficacy is how well a vaccine works in a controlled clinical trial, which is what has been done so far. Effectiveness is how well a vaccine works out in the real world over time which depends on how many people take it, their behavior, and all sorts of things we're gonna get into. And when it's all said and done, effectiveness, it's effectiveness, the portion of people who become immune from the disease, that's how we get to the herd immunity that everyone wants as fast as possible. Now, please remember, we are not in the business of rating vaccines or suggesting how vaccines should be handled or rolled out. We're just talking about the math behind the numbers that go into the terms effective, efficacy, and other things. Kevin, you're up. Thanks, Alan. Now, as Alan said, the biggest news today concerns vaccines and when they'll be available to different groups. Will be this month or next spring, and ultimately when they're available to the entire world. Now, there are more than 55 vaccines currently in clinical trials in humans. We want them to be, and here's that magic word, effective, but what does that mean? Well, the two companies that crossed the clinical trial finish line first were Pfizer and Moderna, and the United Kingdom approved Pfizer's in early December. Now, as Alan will discuss in a moment, the numbers they reported were actually not effectiveness. They reflected efficacy, the results of the clinical trials. So let's look at efficacy first, since that's truly what was reported in the best we can know at this point. So the reported efficacy for Pfizer was 95.1% and 94.1% for Moderna. So where did these numbers come from? Well, I'm happy to say it was basic arithmetic from what were pretty simple experiments. Now, half of the volunteers got a shot of the vaccine and the other half got something like salt water, or placebo, which does nothing. Of course, they didn't know which one they had got. Then when they went out into the world and behaved normally, we waited to see how many from each group got sick. Now let's drill in and look at Pfizer specifically. Out of more than 43,000 volunteers, 170 people contracted COVID during their trial. Of those 170, 162 had gotten the placebo, and eight had gotten the vaccine. Now the efficacy is simply the number of people who got sick despite the vaccine, so in this case eight, divided by the number of people who got sick with the placebo, in this case 162. And then you subtract that figure from one, and you get your 95.1. Now there's a slightly different way of doing this fraction that might make a little more intuitive sense. If 162 people got sick with the placebo and only eight got it with a vaccine, that means 154 people, quote unquote, should have gotten sick, but were, quote unquote, protected by the vaccine. Then you have the 162 people who got sick because they were, quote unquote, unprotected by the placebo, and that's our denominator. And if you divide those two, you'll get 95.1. And this makes sense, 95.1% of volunteers were quote unquote protected from COVID. 
which is exactly what we want from a vaccine. What's great is actually most experts were expecting only about 50 to 70% at this stage. So the efficacy of the Pfizer and Moderna COVID vaccines, being around 95% at these early stages, is outstanding. Now, the bad news is that efficacy is only the beginning. With that, I'll hand it back to Alan. Yeah, that's right. So far, we have talked only about efficacy, but most of the headlines and news reports we see talk about effectiveness, and they use the adjective effective. Are those things synonyms? Uh, no, they are not. Efficacy, as we just discussed, is just the pure result of a controlled trial in individual people. What we've seen with Pfizer is that the vaccine, quote unquote, protected about 95 of every 100 volunteers during the trial. But effectiveness for a vaccine is how much it ultimately stems the disease across a population in real world human beings over time. It's what you really want to know. If I get the vaccine, what are my chances of becoming sick? How many people need to get vaccinated to stamp out the disease in a country? Things like that. And in many cases, effectiveness depends less on the vaccine's scientific efficacy than the unpredictable and often risky behavior of real life human beings. The vaccine could have 100% efficacy, but the disease could still run rampant. And, and why is that? Well. Here are some of the factors that will determine the real world effectiveness of COVID-19 vaccines. I call them the three A's. The first one is availability. What we've heard so far is that only 20, maybe 30 million doses of the vaccines will be available in the next few months. And in the case of the United States, that means no more than about one in 10 adults, let alone children, can be vaccinated in the short term. Then you have to get those vaccines to people, which requires huge distribution networks. And in Pfizer's case, the doses need to be chilled at minus 70 degrees Celsius the entire way, or they become unusable. And that's a huge challenge to get the vaccines out to people. Then of course, adoption. People have to take the vaccine. And according to NBC News, an Ipsos poll of people in 27 countries found that more than 25% said they would not take the vaccine, even if it's approved. In Russia, Poland, Hungary, and France, this number rose to 40%. Again, even, a vaccine, even if the vaccine works 95% of the time, its efficacy, its effectiveness plummets if people don't actually take it, and take it twice, as a matter of fact, in this case. And the last thing is apathy. Don't get lazy. Similarly, we all know that even when a vaccine gets distributed and adopted by even half the population, the other half will almost certainly let their guard down and think everyone is protected by what they hear is a decrease in disease overall. Okay, yeah, it's decreasing 10%, 15%. It's all good. It's all going in the right direction. Well, the problem is, is that everyone still has to practice social distancing and wear masks until we approach close to full vaccination. Otherwise, a ton of, of unvaccinated people will still get sick. And even the people who were vaccinated can get sick because 95% protection still isn't 100%. And we saw this at the Disney World measles outbreak a few years ago. Even some vaccinated people still got the measles because if you keep running around to a lot of people with the measles, one out of 20 times, you're gonna get it. So in COVID's case, tens or even hundreds of thousands of vaccinated people will still get COVID and then infect other people if everyone lets their guard down too fast. So let's all get straight A's, okay? Here's my favorite quote in all of this from A. David Paltiel, a professor at the Yale School of Public Health who wrote an excellent study on this. He said, vaccines don't save lives, vaccination programs save lives. So back to you, Kevin. Yeah, and we've actually seen this before with great success. According to the CDC, these are the effectiveness, again, not efficacy, but the effectiveness of very well-known and adopted vaccines. So that's if you take the vaccine. Well, how many people have to take it for it to get to us to the promised land of herd immunity? And so we've discussed this in a previous episode, the herd immunity threshold which is the percentage of people who need to be immune to a disease for the disease to effectively die out, 
Well, it depends on how fast that particular disease multiplies without any vaccine at all. Remember all the talk about R, the reproduction number? Well, that's the multiplier. And so here's a couple examples. Measles spreads like wildfire without vaccination. So you need about 92 to 95% to be immune to achieve the herd immunity. Well, SARS is lower, about 65%. We're still learning about COVID-19, but early estimations were that it was similar enough to SARS that we'll need about 70 to 80% of the population to be immune. Now, not just vaccinated, but immune for the disease to actually go the way of measles and be all but eradicated. So one thing that I really want to uh, talk about, and I do a lot with my clients and my students, is that when you talk about numbers, believe it or not, the words around them often matter more than the numbers themselves. Let's take a look at how that applies here. You keep hearing about the word effective, okay? Now, what verb, the verb tense, do you use? Well, right now, all we know is that the vaccine was effective, efficacious technically, but it was effective in these trials. But what you're going to hear is that it is effective, the present tense of the verb to be, and that makes all the difference because it confers this factuality, this fact truth that the vaccine is going to work and we don't know that yet until behavior and adoption and the distribution networks confer upon the vaccine its ability to do its thing. And then you're also going to hear from some folks that the vaccine can be effective, which really doesn't tell us anything. Uh, another word to look out for is for when people say the vaccine works. And we've seen this before. Uh, Apple used to say uh, their computers just worked. And what it basically tells you is it works all the time. The problem is, is things, particularly in public health, don't work all the time, and you can't just say it works. Thanks, Alan, great insights. So let's look at our three takeaways for, for this episode. So effective and efficacy. Remember, they don't mean the same thing. The efficacy is the ratio of people who got sick despite having the vaccine and the people who got it with the placebo whereas the effectiveness is how much the vaccine ultimately decreases the disease in the real world. So whereas efficacy is scientific and relates to a controlled trial, effective relates to the real world and the three A's that we need to monitor that Alan mentioned, availability, adoption, and apathy. And finally, herd immunity is determined by effectiveness, which we still won't know for a while. So listen, folks, as a reminder, if you want to discuss this more or want us to cover something you've seen out there in the media or online, uh, or online here is where to reach us. And make sure to include the hashtag BeDataBrilliant in your social post. You can also email us at hello at thedataliteracyproject.org. We are on Instagram. We are on Twitter. We are all over the place. Please join the conversation. For Kevin Hannigan, I'm Alan Schwartz. We'll see you soon on another episode of Know Your Data.